So today we have the great opportunity to hear from these experts about this future world of work and what education will look like as we move forward. So I'm going to actually start out by just letting each of you introduce yourself and just a very brief introduction of your work and, and how this new world of work kind of intersects with that. Sure. Um, hello, I'm Christina Trombley, uh, Executive Director for Drake's University's Drake Online and Continuing Education. In my role, um, we work a lot with uh, talent development and the Des Moines area business community to ensure not only that our graduates have the skills and the degrees that businesses are looking for, but that we're also uh, providing just-in-time training for, to help them continue to grow the, the workforce that they need right now. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. My name is Tej Dhawan. I uh, serve as Chief Data Officer for Principal, which means I'm the, the Chief Steward of all of our customers and, and transactional data. That data is what feeds our AI engines, it feeds our robotic process automation, it feeds our transactions, and it feeds our, feeds our customer experiences with us. So all of this topic is highly relevant. Uh, as, as a second part of my life, on the other end of the talent pipeline, I uh, serve as uh, a trustee for a Central College's Board of Trustees. So to see what students are coming into the education space for, what they're learning in a liberal arts environment, and then as they graduate, how do they transition into a workforce that will look remarkably different in each of the next five decades that they're likely to work. So those are the two perspectives uh, I'd like to bring to this conversation, and uh, hopefully to your questions. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Andy Van Clunen. I'm the CEO of National Skills Coalition. So National Skills Coalition is an organization we're based in Washington, D.C., but we do work with folks all over the country, including some folks who are in the room today, business leaders, community colleges, community organizations, workforce boards, uh, all trying to kind of figure out how it is that we can change the conversation about what we as a country need to do to invest in our people, to help industries grow, to help companies meet the bottom line, and to give a lot of folks an opportunity to get a good paying, skilled job and a long-term career. And we do that by bringing the perspectives of people who are doing this work on the ground in industries all over the country into Washington to talk to members of Congress and the administration about things that we could do in changing, changing workforce policies, education policies, a number of other areas which I know we're going to get into. And so for the future of work, for us, this is a big set of issues, not just about what it is that we're going to do today to get folks into available jobs that companies can't fill, but how it is that we're trying to think about the next generation of policies that we will need to be able to keep companies and workers nimble and able to respond to this new set of technological changes in our workplaces. Andy, thank you so much, and thank you again for National Skills Coalition sponsors, sponsorship of today. And I should have also mentioned that the Future World of Work initiative that we've uh, been undertaking at the partnership, we have great representation of Drake University and many of our other education institutions um, um, supporting that and participating, and Tej has been very instrumental in that work too. And I do want to thank Greg Nichols in the audience for your leadership in, in that work. So, um, the format today, uh, we will have this informal conversation, and I will start by uh, to tossing a few questions out to our panelists, and then uh, we will open it up for audience Q and A um, around 5:40 or so, or 4:40. Excuse me. So um, let's start kind of going back to this Brookings Institute report and the fact that it says that really uh, no job will be unaffected by um, this disruption and change that technology will bring to us all in a very positive way. So um, what, what are your thoughts on what the future of work will look like? and? Who are those people or types of jobs that will most likely be impacted? Um, maybe um, sequentially, who you're seeing maybe first and how that, that plays out. Um, and just kind of what that impact might look like. And Andy, why don't we start with you as our sponsor? Sure. Thanks, Mary. Um, well, so in some ways, 
if you're running a company, you probably know that the future of work is today, right? Some of the challenges that many industries are facing uh, to your point, Mary, about the number of jobs that have been already impacted by technology. I mean, this is something that if you're doing this work on the ground, this has been a dynamic in our labor market for quite a while. Um, the new conversation is that there's going to be new types of technology, and is that going to have some kind of different effect, even on accelerating both the challenges that folks are going to have to find people who can fill current positions, and then how much of the current positions that are in companies are going to change dramatically. And so those, it, the first two uh, in, the, in the Brookings report, and Brookings has a version of this, McKinsey has a version, Bain has a version, but they'll, if, you, they'll, if you take kind of like the most impacted and the medium impacted jobs, the ones that are going to substantially change that we think will be required some kind of training to keep workers able to do that job in the next five to ten years, it's about 60% of the labor market. So in a, in a country that has 160 million workers or so, that's over 90 million jobs. So as a public policy organization, it's worth thinking about is there anything out there that is starting to talk about how it is that government could be working more effectively with industry to train, retrain 90 million current workers, in addition to figuring out where it is that the new skilled workers are going to be coming from in order to be able to fill jobs as people retire and things like that. And that's going to be a challenge. And that story is going to be different from industry to industry. The challenges in manufacturing are going to be different than those in healthcare or logistics or energy and extraction or retail. Um, and I think that in, in the conversations that I'm a part of in Washington, people talk a lot about all the jobs that are going to disappear without really talking about the new jobs that are going to replace them. They don't talk at all about the current jobs that are going to change dramatically. And they don't talk at all about how that is going to play out differently from industry to industry. Nor do they pay attention to the fact that there's different groups of workers in each of those industries that are going to be impacted differently. The workforce composition in healthcare is very different than the workforce composition in manufacturing. And the ability to train people is somewhat dependent on the work environments in which they're working and the level of education that they're already bringing into those, into those workplaces. And that too is going to be something that we're going to need policies and industry strategies that are going to be different based on what workers are currently able to do and how those industries are going to change moving forward. And finally, these changes are going to look very different in smaller companies than they are in larger companies. So, you know, our, our national and international leading companies in this country, they already are retraining their folks, they're investing a lot of money to keep their people able to use the newest technology and to keep themselves ahead of the competitive curve. But smaller companies, not just the capital investment that's going to be required for some of this, this technology, but what are the training strategies and where they're going to get help from that, it's going to play out very differently for smaller firms. And if we don't think about that and think about how most of the jobs in this country are provided by smaller employers and where it is that we're going to be partnering with them in a more effective way, I think that that's another whole part of the future work conversation that's basically been missed, at least in how it is that policymakers are talking about in Washington right now. Tej. So, um, I think as humans, we seem to resist and fear change. And if you think about technology at any level, whether it was the printing press or it is the AI sitting in your current version of the iPhone, if that's what you're using, um, tech within that technology creates fear. Uh, the jobs that were lost with the printing press were those who deciphered the sacred texts at that time. Simple. Uh, the jobs that are going to change are any job that requires any process with a human element attached to it. Whether it's a manual process where we're turning a widget or we're typing something in or we're asking a question, that job is going to change. Human evolution is based on change. So the fear of what tomorrow will bring is largely dependent on how ready we feel we are as humans to accept or reject the change. So as far as I'm concerned, I look at my job in the role I am today will not be there at principle probably in three to four years. It didn't exist two years ago. I was never trained for this job, the, the one I hold today, and it won't be there within the next five years, guaranteed. So I have to prepare for change also. Uh, Change is inevitable. The only thing that's different this time than 100 years ago is that the pace of change is increasing at an even more uncomfortable rate. And then finally, as humans, um, 
we fear things that we cannot do with our hands or feet or eyes or, or things that make us move. I think the, the insurance against that fear of change is things that are body parts that are truly not realized. Think about it, emotion, uh, mind, soul. Things that are not associated with direct body parts are still not easily, technically doable by a machine. Easily. They are doable, but not easily. So I'd, I'd start with that and uh, pass it on to Christina. I agree that the, it's the pace of change that we're now struggling with, but I think when we look at what AI and robotics is going to do, one of the other things that both government and business and education all have to get used to is a comfort with ambiguity. Because I do actually, when you look at both the research and the methodology and you look at what could happen, I do believe that this is actually going to create a lot more jobs than we're going to lose or the jobs are going to morph. And when you look at the hundreds of years we've been here and working, you will see that that's not unusual. Um, we do that all the time. And a lot of how we do it is actually what I would argue is on the job training. You know, the job morphs and you learn how to do your job in a new way. And I think that's going to happen for a lot of the people who are, might be impacted, but their entire job isn't going away. And even the bulk of the work, just a few key pieces might change significantly and they're going to need to adapt with that. The challenge I would argue is because we really don't know what is going to be needed for some of these new jobs, Businesses don't know what they're going to be looking for, what skills they're going to hire, so education's not able to really put anything in the pipeline to help train this, so it's all of this ambiguity. And how do we move forward from that? And that's when I talk about just-in-time training. We'll do our best to graduate students with the skills that will help them adapt to all of these changes, that's important. But then we have to be there to help businesses so when that job changes and there's a specific skill. If you haven't done this, I recommend you go do this. Just Google new jobs that AI creates and look at what's out there because it's amazing. My favorite one so far is an empathy consultant. And these people will work with the data programmers to help Alexa and Siri be able to understand if you're feeling anxious when you ask them a question. So that sounds like a good job and I would like that one in my retirement. <laughs> <laughs> well, Christina, I think both you and Tej uh, touched on something. Um, one, Tej, you said, you know, that you hadn't prepared for this job, so to speak, and you're two years into it and probably be out of it in three years. But in today's world, uh, and the jobs, as you said, Christina, um, are really more about those foundational competencies and then the constant relearning of the skills where you can capitalize on those core competencies and foundational skills. So you touched a little bit, Christina, on education and how that just in time needs to change. Um, so let's talk a little bit more from each of your perspectives on how will the delivery of education need to change in this, this new world? And how will we assess um, people's skills and competencies in new ways? Um, well, I think that we're already seeing some of that happen now. Um, I think right now you're seeing businesses who are saying, you know, I just need to know that this person knows how to do X. And so education has responded by doing what we call micro-credentials, badging. And what that is, it's not only providing that education, and sometimes we're not even the ones providing the education. What we're providing is we have assessed that this person does indeed have this competency. So when they say they have a badge, they have a certificate, they have something that's less than a full degree, it says, yes, Drake or any other higher educational institution has said, you know, yep, they have passed this competency. So you're going to see a lot more of that. The other thing that I think you're going to see a lot more of um, that's already happened, but I think it's going to really strengthen, you're going to be seeing a lot more what might be called a private-public partnership 
or businesses really tying themselves to higher education institutions so that they are helping to set up that pipeline. We have this workforce, here are the skills that we want them to have, and we're willing to partner with the educational institution to ensure that these people go through it in a timely manner and get what they need so as to not disrupt the business as much as if, if they were going to leave the workforce and take on a degree program. You're already seeing that happen, and I think you're going to see a lot more of it. So the, the, the root or the definition of liberal arts is not how to become a liberal politically. It is, it is how to be a free person. <coughs> at, at, at its very root, liberal arts means education that leads you to be a free person. And a free person is able to live in a society, earning and doing what they can do best to make their life better. So if you were to think about what will the jobs of tomorrow require, it is our ability to shift. And what prepares you to shift than not having been trained to do just one job? It is being trained to do, trained to learn, and trained to continuously pivot as needed to be and to remain a free person. Um, so I would say uh, the, the, my ask of the political climate would be not just to ask of our institutions of higher education at all levels, from high schools through graduate programs, to just teach our students to do one job. That, in that realm, we're doing the most disservice to that work, worker entering the workforce, because all we've trained them to do is one thing. Uh, instead, we should be training how to continue learning in an interdisciplinary approach. So the liberal arts colleges around the country, including my own alma mater, are being unfairly treated uh, because I think it's the liberal arts colleges end to end, uh, edge to edge of the country, that are probably preparing the students for the future that's, uh, that's in our next 50 to 75 years. Um, ultimately, I, I look at um, all of the programs that teach things like data analytics, analytics. If you think about what is data analytics but an advanced degree in statistics combined with programming. Perfect. It'll give you a wonderful career to start and, and, and coast for a while. But what accelerates that degree to the next level is what companies like ours are looking for in terms of how do you understand empathy, customer behavior, customer interaction, or, or just, just human behavior, whether it's in sales, marketing, or, um, or service, those elements have an even deeper link into statistics. Where do those disciplines come from? The humanities. It's sociology. It's psychology. That's where some of the human behavior portions come in, and data analytics suddenly becomes superpowered. That interdisciplinary, this interdisciplinary approach through liberal arts is, is likely the positive force for our uh, future education than, uh, than a negative one that, that our political climate would currently uh, ascribe. Well, let me respond to some things that both Christina and Tej said. I mean, starting with the feel, feeling of political tension around how much talk about whether or not a liberal arts degree still has worth or not in the labor market. I think there's, there's no debating the fact that a liberal arts de degree when applied in the right way, can and does for many people. Um, I think, and I have a liberal arts degree, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bash it, but I, but I will say this, I do think that what we have not done effectively as a country, we certainly have not done effectively from a public policy perspective, is talk about there are multiple paths by which people are going to get some kind of post-secondary education and training. Christina's examples of people who are now not even thinking about degrees or credentials, but micro-credentials, like, particular types of competency that have application for a current employer that you're working for or that you know can move from one firm to another firm within the industry. And a lot of the times when we're training people for jobs, we are actually training them to multitask. The way you train um, somebody in a job today may be very different than it was five year, years ago, in part because our workforces are being asked to be much more flexible. They're playing different kind of roles. And so we should be training people in that way. I think what I would, what I would advocate for 
is to make sure that whether somebody is trying to pursue a four-year degree or somebody is trying to pursue some kind of credential that has some value in the labor market that's going to get them that first job or it's going to help them advance and then allow them an opportunity to continue to learn and earn over the course of their careers, um, I think we should both make both of those options available. I will say I'm most concerned about the almost 40 million folks currently in our workforce um, concentrated in industries that are going to be very much impacted by some of the automation that we're talking about. Retail, hospitality, healthcare, uh, food service. Those folks, I mean, in terms of what we can make available to them today to help them train to stay ahead of, long, ahead of this technological curve, the reality is, is that 60% of them aren't reading at a level that will allow them to take their first community college course. 70% of them don't have the math or digital literacy skills, sometimes even to take one of the online courses that Christina's offering at Drake. And so what is it that we're going to do with these folks who are currently employed and their employers want to figure out how it is to get them more skills? How is it that we're going to be working with those industries to figure out how to help those workers as well as those who, because they've had some other kind of reservoir and experience in education, can take advantage of some of the online learning or other kinds of opportunities that are out there. And I think that that's going to be a challenge that government policy absolutely has to be a part of it, but industry is going to have to be a partner in that too. Um, last year at Davos, I guess it was earlier this year, so Davos, the big gathering in Switzerland, all the corporate leaders from the world and political leaders, they all get together in Switzerland and they hang out and they talk about what's going on with the world economy and there was a lot of talk about what automation and AI was going to, what impact it was going to have. And there, the World Economic Forum did an analysis of companies here in the US. And they said, we just looked at a few million workers are going to be most impacted in the next couple of years. We estimate that there's a $34 billion price tag to be able to retrain those workers to allow them to stay in their jobs and maintain their current income. And then the question was to the private sector, so what is it that you think that you could do to pick up some of that cost? And the answer was, they, when they tallied it all up, about 20%, 20 to 25% of the cost. So the headlines in the New York Times where industry only wants to spend 25% of the retraining cost for what's going to happen for these people who are going to be impacted by automation. What, what, of course, the Times didn't cover, but what was really important in the report was, but that's if we're doing it on a company-by-company -company basis. If we've got manufacturers to work effectively together, we've got healthcare providers to work effectively together, if we've got retailers to work effectively together as an industry, we could increase with, with what they're spending, that could get up to 50% of the cost, right? If we organize by industry, by sector, and that's where I think public policy can have a really important impact. It's actually things that Iowa has been doing as a state for years in a variety of different ways. Then public sector, if the private sector can put up 50% of the cost, then we as the public sector should put up the other 50% of the cost. And then we can start to figure out like how it is that we can move those people to keep them ahead of the curve. So I do think, and you know, when we're thinking about how, not just how it is that we're structuring learning, but how it is that we're structuring industry to be a platform by which that learning can take place for their workers, I think it's, we really need to think about how we can get firms to work with each other by industry to, to make some of that happen. Excellent point. I, that was going to be my next oh, question. How, no, thank you. Uh, how business um, engages in all of this. But you, you brought up a really great point, Andy, in that there are absolutely multiple pathways for individuals to learn, and it's not an end-all game anymore. It's a step along the way, and it has to be this constant learning and what I need at any given time. Um, but we haven't been, been very good at a, as a country in selling that or talking about um, that there are, are options for individuals, particularly our young people, to um, enter into great careers, but to start with those foundational skills that will make them successful in, in a variety of ways. Um, Actually, for 40 years, we've kind of hammered home that if you didn't have the four-year degree, you were not going to be successful. So as we look forward, and it's only going to increase, I believe, the options that individuals will need, how do we talk about that, or how do we market that uh, in a different way? So I, I saw this uh, bumper sticker on 35 the other day. Uh, it said, learners never graduate. There is no four-year degree for a true learner, um, and I, I saw this, uh, saw the, saw the, the, the feeling 
described much better in a book called Robot Proof, how universities must uh, educate their future students so that they can robot proof their careers. So uh, this interesting book by Joseph Allen, uh, president of Northeastern University in Boston, he, uh, he postulated the idea. What if the four-year degree was sold as a lifetime of 400 credits or 300 or 100, whatever the number of credits uh, computes to, so that you, you received a base of learning uh, to get your bachelor's degree. And then as your career, as your life progressed, you took courses from that or other associated universities throughout your lifetime. It, this, wasn't a, this wasn't a financial structure that was quite proposed yet, but a theory, an idea that said, what if you thought differently about the four-year degree? Uh, so you never really truly graduated in life from education. You continued learning. Uh, I, I think that's, that's a concept. I mean, I, I think about the courses I'm taking today just, just to further my education. Um, the, the certificate that's offered at the end, actually I don't even print half the time anymore because it's, it's not relevant. It's the education that mattered more than the cert at the end of the course. That's where we need to be with, with, our, with our student body. That's where we need to be with our kids. That's where we need to be with our coworkers and, and those we are responsible for. But I do think um, you obviously are very uh, confident that you know that what you're learning is going to apply to your career. I think that we have a lot of folks out there that may not be as confident that, and quite frankly, I think we've, we've not well served some folks that they've gotten that certification and they have found out after the fact that it actually had no value in the labor market or what have you. So I do think it is incumbent upon us to be able to give some guidance about what is a quality credential, what has some recognition by industry, um, what, is a, what is a pathway that if you earn this, like how it is that you could you could stack it over time to advance your career. I do think that that is something that we have not done a great job doing. Uh, it's brought some disrepute to online learning, uh, which I think is unfortunate, uh, but it's because there's a lot of players out there who are not actually giving something that has value. So I think we need to do something to make sure that we're giving people some guidance about what they're learning and what, how it's gonna set them up for further learning or what job they might be getting from. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that I think when you look at things like this, you have to think about all of the different populations and how there's such inequity in what's provided and what's accessible and what the expectations are. Um, there are, there is a growing number of students who have graduated with credentials and are underemployed. And there is still a very large and growing population of people who don't have access to education that would move them forward into a lot of these careers that we, don't ha we won't have enough people for. So the lifetime learning, I think, is an interesting idea. I think there's still a whole lot of people who don't even understand what that might get you. So I think that conversation has to start a whole lot sooner before people start looking at, you know, institutions of higher education. And I don't think that you can just look at a K through 12 and put that there. This is a far reaching and multi-layered complex issue that I think will have long term effects on what autom automation is going to be doing. So I wish I had a great answer, but I think if we don't look at it as a whole, there's not going to be much that changes. Can, can anyone look at education as a whole when education really, the desire for and the, the initiative toward mm -hmm. a need for or, or a need for education is really more internal? Can, can there be a singular entity or does it have to be much more distributed? I don't know that needs to be a singular entity, but I think that there has been a large inequity among this country of how education is both offered and taken and valued. And that, I think, needs to be something that, as we're talking about that, from a policy perspective, from an industry perspective, from a personal perspective, if we don't start having 
real conversations about that, I don't see a real impact on some of what we're talking about here. It's very hard to say come be a lifetime, do a lifetime of learning if you were never taught that education will hold any value or return in your entire life. True, true. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the government's making the decision, right? Right. We just need to figure out, so if you can get, if there's 12 different welding certificates that you can earn, you know, if you kind of go online or through across a bunch of different schools and training centers, but there's only two of them that local industry will actually hire you to. We just need local industry to communicate that. And we need, and what government can do is to provide that information to people as they're trying to figure out, okay, which of these programs should I enroll in? Which are the ones that have success in actually getting people into jobs? Which graduates actually increase their wages over time? Do they go back and they go back for further learning? That's the kind of information that through public policy we can provide, even if the content and the standards are being set by industry, it's not being set by government. Okay. Very good. Um, so you, you kind of touched on a little bit um, some of the things that could be done legislatively. Um, are there any proposals that are currently being considered in Congress or being put forward by candidates uh, that you think respond um, to this issue? Um, well, so, uh, and folks living in this state who've probably seen or talked to or heard a lot from all of the folks at least running for the Democratic nomination, and so you know that all of them have some kind of free college or, or tuition or a debt-free uh, college proposal, whether it's for a four-year college or for, it's for a community college. Um, you know, and I will say, listen, if, if, if I were running for the Democratic nomination, that those sets of proposals pull very well with prospective Democratic voters, including here in Iowa. Um, you know, it's about like 50 or so percent for a four-year, maybe about 70 percent or so for the for the community free community college. Um, it does not pull great across all party lines. And if you're really trying to figure out like what is it that can be done that actually can bring Republicans and Democrats and independents together to actually kind of create the groundswell that we think is going to be necessary to move some of these issues forward. Investments in skills training, broadly defined, 90% support, Republicans and Democrats both. It is, it is a no-brainer in terms of, because people recognize that training that's gonna prepare me for a job and prepare me for a career, that makes a lot of sense. It's not gonna put me into debt. It's something that I know has a return. If I can get the information about where it is that that's gonna help advance my career, that's something that everybody gets across the board. Um, and I think that you know we have some really good models even here in in Iowa about how it is that we can take something like the higher education system to do a better job of providing that. So, in you know at the federal level, tuition aid is really uh, Pell grants in particular tend to go to folks who are pursuing pursuing degree programs. Here in Iowa, you have a gap tuition program which allows people to get some assistance to take shorter term programs, skills that are connected to a local industry. It's incredibly popular, it's very effective. Um, I was here with Governor Reynolds about a year ago talking about the fact that this is something that Washington should be paying more attention to, that uh, the candidates who are running for office should be paying attention to this. As I, we have other states around the country have kind of figured out that making financial aid more flexible is one way that we can make it easier for folks to get onto a college campus or to take an online course. But then what we need to do in addition is that we need to demonstrate that industry is part of the development of those programs. We need partnerships with, with institutions of higher education and industry. We need to have data so that people know which are the programs that are putting folks into jobs and which are not. Um, and we need to figure out other ways that, that we can help people succeed so once they get on the job from that, from that education or training that they can continue to advance their careers over time. So I think we're not hearing, and I will say, if you talk to some of the candidates, if you read down into some of their positions, they actually do have some interesting things around apprenticeship and investments in, in skills training and career and technical education. They're just not really talking about it. And I think that we should be asking them to talk about it because in many ways, I feel like that is the thing that we have the most chance of advancing in this country. And so let's start to get that as being part of the conversation. You know, I like to hear talked about uh, in the debate in two nights. I mean, then we, we are constantly trying to figure out like, where is this issue that polls well? Iowans want to hear about it. Business leaders want to hear about it. Why aren't the candidates talking about it? Yeah, no. 
I, I would, uh, the, the one thing I would add is many of the, many of the programs that Andy is referring to, I think part of the reason Iowa doesn't talk about it as much is because Iowa has been at the forefront of doing some of this already. So our, our, our um, impetus is to continue investing and supporting these programs. You know, if we look at, if we look at the statewide um, numbers, there are 25-ish private institutions in the state of Iowa. Average discount rate for tuition, room, and board for students is well above 50%. It's, it's in the upper 60s. There is a large number of student population that is able to go to, uh, able to go and obtain a, a private college education for around 30 some percent of the, of the list price. Um, similarly, the state institutions are doing a remarkable job of, the, of, of providing the degree programs that are already on the books. Further, the Future Ready Iowa pipeline is is building toward that skills gap um, and then connecting local industry. I know of one such program in, in Pella where Central College is located. Buena Vista is doing something tweaked, different for itself, but remarkable. Simpson, same thing. Drake, similar. So I think our institutions are engaged with the specific industry. And then from an industry perspective, I think Back to your 50% question or uh, remark from the WEF, um, my team, you know, so, so my peer group, uh, data and analytics people, we, we said, as, as a company, we've been a digital company for 60 some years. We've, we've had everything from punch cards to petabytes of data. Um, how do we continue training toward this changing world? So we said, well, you know, rather than go out, let's look inward first and say, what if we wanted to train our peer group? What would we do? So we, we created a session and invited people thinking we'd have 20-ish people show up. 400 some people showed up to a data and analytics session. And we quickly realized that we had such a, such a wide talent uh, 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 spectrum in there that we had to start with something really simple that mattered to the audience in front of us. And we just had to say, let's, Quit looking back. Let's quit asking what did what happened in our business. Let's start asking why is it happening today. That's the path to AI, right? AI is how do I change something automatically? Reporting, if we look at pieces of paper that show numbers, we're just looking in the past. If we ourselves aren't training ourselves to shift, how can we sh encourage others to shift? So we started with a simple question and have expanded that core curriculum insight. Uh, just amongst ourselves and, and, and started training in the hundreds. I think individuals or companies, small and large, will, will have to take some more of that initiative to connect to these larger statewide or national or regional elements that, that, that are trying to bridge that skills gap. Dej, that's, that's really excellent in the fact that, um, as we've said, more and more companies, industries, are going to have to take ownership themselves and and really look at their existing incumbent workforce and provide these trainings. So internally, as you do this, then how is that valued on your employees' pathway or their um, evaluation to next positions? So we. Um Principal, uh, as a company, encourages uh, the intermovement uh, uh, within the company of of our of our talent. Um, if 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 you could have heard Dan Houston, our CEO, talk uh, this summer, one of the things he mentioned was uh, a, a college graduate coming out uh, in May of 2019 was likely to have 12 careers over his or her lifetime. When I graduated from college, that number was four or five. So 2019 uh, graduates were looking at a dozen careers. And what his statement uh, was that those dozen careers could be had within the walls of that one company. So the way, the way we value some of this continuous learning is by saying, uh, encouraging uh, the, the cross movement. I have, I have a, a 41 year veteran of the company on my team who recently moved after 
um, after really writing assembler code through Java code and then becoming a, a data analyst. And she decided that she was a better engineer in data analytics, so she shifted her career 41 years in in the company. Anyone can do that as long as the structure is there. So we've created the structure to allow for that talent movement. Yeah, the structure and then again, getting back to those core competencies that allow that, that movement. So it's fabulous. Any other comments on what Tej just shared? I, I just want to give all credit to what, Prince, what Tej is describing and principal as a company because they clearly are I think an industry leader who is kind of valuing learning uh, across a lot of their workforce and having these kind of opportunities where folks can make lateral moves and vertical moves. Um, I do think that is kind of, that is the way that more companies are going to have to do business. Um, I think, and I'm sure principals doing that at significant cost with the expectation that there's going to be returns to the company over time. I do think one of the things that we can think about is how we can make it easier uh, and I, I should also mention that principal has been part of these conversations in DC as well. We've been very thankful of their willingness to kind of bring these issues to light uh, with Congress uh, and past and current administration. Um, I think we need to think a little bit about how it is that we can make it easier or create better incentives for other leaders in the private sector to take that kind of approach. Um, private sector spends a tremendous amount of money on worker training. I mean, it's, I mean if you take it all told, it's estimated somewhere around $650 billion a year here in the U.S. I mean, that's huge. That dwarfs anything that we're spending in terms of public, public spending. Um, some of the challenge is that most of that money goes to workers who have already gone to college, right? So in industries where we have a greater diversity of workers, like how is it that we can help for those folks who have not gone to college, who may not even be reading at a 12th grade reading level, how is it that we should value them as much and figure out whether it's a combination of public and private dollars or different ways that we're using incentives or some other ways to get more of the private sector money across the entire workforce in the company. Because I do think, back to the scale issues, that is something that we're going to have to come up with. Um, otherwise, we are going to have some workers who are going to be continually invested in by their employers because they're valued, but we have some other workers that are likely to be left behind unless we come up with some of that fix as well. So I, I would say, um as, as a community member, so I'm taking off my principal hat, uh, my connection to Jay and the partnership started to try and, in, in trying to uh, uh, cultivate or nurture small communities of those who were trying to build something in Iowa. It wasn't just startups, it wasn't just tech companies, it wasn't just businesses. One of the highlight training grounds for us is uh, an organization called Pi 515. Uh, this tiny organization, with probably the smallest budget I know in a nonprofit locally. Um, trains uh, largely female um, refugee students in computer science. Meager budget. Uh, they'll accept a, a really well working computer and deploy it with their student base. They're working out of a church basement because that's the only space they can afford. Guess what? They're making massive impact because every one of those kids is, is showing up to open houses that principal hosts for middle to high schoolers. And then they see what the workforce looks like. They see successful men and women who sometimes look like them. More often than not, they don't look like them at all. And yet are, are energized to say, I could do that. I have the opportunities through something like Pi 515. Let's, let's support that. I, I personally, so this, again, this is purely personal. I support Pi 515 because I don't have to wait around for anybody to do it, but every chance I get, I will support that organization with, with a senator, with the governor, with, with anybody who listens. Uh, that's the kind of support. We need to build that ground up support also, not just wait for top down. And, and you just really brought up a great point of, again, as we've talked about different pathways, those young people, uh, when they graduate from high school, could very well be ready to walk in the door at principal and then you bring them along with that education and lifelong learning that they need because they're, they're truly amazing young people and you're right, it's grassroots being done on a very meager budget. I'm gonna just open it up to the audience. We've uh, been shared a lot of 
great information and thoughts. What's kind of brewing in your heads right now? Yes. And we do have a mic coming your way. So I feel like a lot of, uh, sorry, today we've, we've talked a lot about preparing future candidates for future jobs. And uh, sorry, Christina and Andy, you both mentioned a little bit about working with employees whose jobs might be at risk completely, if not you know, seriously affected. Um, and those are the things I'm more worried about, those less skilled workers and those less skilled positions like warehouses getting automated, you know, semi-truck drivers not even having to drive a truck anymore, drones dropping off packages on people's doorsteps. You know, when those kinds of workers who might be in the middle of their careers, you know, 30s, 40s, when they lose their jobs or their jobs are seriously affected and they can't drop what they're doing to go back to school and get re-educated, you know, maybe because they already have families or their financial situation doesn't cater to that. What are some solutions for those kinds of employees? Because I'm pretty sure that's a big part of the workforce are those less skilled workers who don't have those same opportunities to get education and put that same importance on education. Um, so, you know, what are some solutions for those industries and those employees in them? Andy, a lot of the 70 million that you talked about, right? Right, absolutely. Well, so, um, I, you know, a, a lot of, because I've been harping on the fact that we have a lot of those folks for whom we could be doing something more. Both the public sector and the private sector could be working more effectively. So, for instance, one of the things we can and should be doing is Digital literacy is kind of the coin of the realm. It's going to be moving forward. Um, what is it that we need to do today to work with industry to assess the digital literacy levels of everybody on their workforce, to project where they're going to need to be to still be working in that company, whether it's in a job that they're currently performing or in a different job within the company? And then what is it that we as a country can do to commit to moving them to that baseline digital literacy so they can actually train continue to stay employed, and if necessary, move to another job in that company or in that industry? How should we make higher education more uh, flexible for people who are currently holding down a job that are not going to take a degree program but could take some shorter term course that's going to keep them ahead of the technological curve? Um, what is it that we can do to get employers to invest not just in their higher skilled workers but to help them invest in their entry level workers, a lot of the folks that you're talking about? Uh, and then I do think we also need to have an honest conversation about how it is that for folks who are going to go through an employment transition, whether it's through trade or whether it's through technology or even just the business cycle, what is it that we as a country are willing to commit to in terms of retraining, income support, health care, whatever is required to kind of get people past that bridge to get them into their next career. I think we need to have a serious conversation about that as well. Yeah, I would just add that uh, I've been in higher ed for 25 years, and although what automation is doing and the speed in which it's doing it is, and the number of people it will affect is larger than anything I've seen before, the actual what's going to happen, we've seen that. We've seen industries, um, you know, close out. We've seen warehouses. We've seen, I come from, Wisconsin, which is a huge manufacturing state, and we've seen what automation has already done to manufacturing. And so higher education is actually designed to be able to react to that very quickly. Um, they have long-term partnerships with both government and um, all of the programs that are already, will that need to be changed? Will we need to be more flexible? Are we looking at how we're doing that? Absolutely. But should certain industries or certain companies find themselves where they have a group of people who need to be reskilled, we've done that. And we've done it quickly and we've done it well. I'm, done. I'm not speaking about Drake. I'm just speaking about education as a whole. So I did just want to play on that, Christine, a little bit. Because quite honestly, we have a system, you said the word react, that is set up to react after the fact. Mm -hmm. So we have an unemployment system and a job retraining system. How do we turn that around so it's proactive and they don't get into that situation? Uh, realistically, we, we do what Andy says, and we try and do that now. You know, we work with businesses, we try and 
help them assess where their employees are, what skill levels can help them be prepared for whatever's coming next. Pragmatically, it really is up to the business, though, how much they want to engage either with the programs, with education. You know, we, we're there. We're happy. One of the things that I think is, is a challenge is the paying. Who's going to pay for it? It takes resources. If you have a workforce that's really busy, that's time. Um, when we talk about you know financial aid and the flexibility of that, that certainly is going to be needed. But also business needs to look, I think, right now at how they provide their professional development dollars or any of their training fees. I know of a lot of programs that right now you have to earn credit. If you want to get reimbursed for the cost of your education, it's got to be a four credit model. But we've just talked about badging, micro-credentials. These are not credit normally or degree seeking people. And yet, if they want to build these skills for the betterment of either their business or their own skill set, they either have to pay for it out of their own pocket because they will not get reimbursed by the businesses. So it's one of those areas that I think needs to be looked at and businesses can also start embracing the pace of this change and realizing that it's all changing and how they ask their employees to engage has to change with it. Continuous learning is, is an employer's responsibility also. If, if, if you're working for an employer who doesn't value that, especially in today's market, look. Uh, I, 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 would be, I would be hard pressed to continue working for somebody who didn't want to invest in me because I'm investing in the company also every single day I work. So I would, I would invest in the employer who invests in me. Great question. Dave. Uh, hey, good afternoon, Dave Stone, United Way. Nice to see you guys all again. Um, thank you for the shout out, Andy, for the gap in the PACE programs and the Skilled Worker Fund. I still think that's a fight every year to maintain where we're at and we can grow that. I just saw a report last week over 6.1 million was given out in the last dollar scholarship through Future Ready Iowa. But that's a drop in the bucket of what we need to do for the access problem to higher education and particularly short term credentials and skills. Can you talk about the Pell Grant and what we need to do at the federal level there just a little bit? Sure, well the good news is, um, if you're looking for some good news coming out of Washington, there actually is strong bipartisan agreement that we need to make the Pell Grant more flexible to the kinds of things that you've just laid out, right? So what are these shorter term programs that may not be 600 clock hours, which is basically what the requirement now is at the federal level. We just kind of came up with that number um, of seat time and say, like, what is it? Let's figure out what it is that you need to learn for this particular thing that's going to help it increase your wages or going to put you on a path, whether it's on the credit or the non credit side. Let's make sure that it's quality. Let's make sure it's connected to industry. Uh, let's make sure that it's got some data behind it to show that people do succeed when they get it. Uh, we have a uh, piece of legislation we've been working on for years called the Jobs Act. I'm very happy that Senator Ernst has just become one of the co-sponsors of that legislation, um, along with a lot of Democrats and Republicans in both the House and the Senate, um, that this is what they think is a priority of one of the ways as we think about changing higher education to make it work for working people in this country. It's actually something that Governor Reynolds was calling for, for support from Washington. I was saying, like, we are doing everything that we can with the budget that we have, but if Washington could make some of their resources a little bit more flexible to help expand what we've already tested and proven here in Iowa, that would be incredibly helpful. So the good news is, is that we've got strong support on both sides of the aisle for it. Now we just need to kind of get it through. And as you can imagine, there's a few other things preoccupying Congress right now. But we, are, we still are holding strong that with a good push from folks like you, we have a chance of getting that across the finish line before the end of this uh, congressional session. Other questions? So, Christine, I'm going to go back to something that you had mentioned, um, kind of the inequality, the inequities of access, or really understanding the importance of education. Um, and we see that among different demographics. Do you still see this as a bit of an urban-rural issue, too, or not so much anymore? Uh, I think it, 
I think it can be. Um, I think urban and rural comes with its own set of issues, though. Um, sometimes a parallel, it looks a lot the same, and sometimes very different. One of the biggest things that rural communities um, struggle with is just bandwidth. And, you know, when we talk about online education, or you talk about accessibility, or you talk about just internet access, rural communities in the United States are still struggling with that. And the way everything is going, if you can't even get gain access to that, how can we expect you to even understand it as a worker? So I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we see in rural America today. I, I'd say that whether it is my kids who began their school in Johnston or I who began my schooling in New Delhi, it wasn't anything except the, the caring teacher who made the difference in whether I wanted to learn in any meaningful way. So unless we value teachers for who they are and what they're worth, any amount of uh, learning that we implement through philosophy or policy is going to be ineffective. The, the learning that started for me was with my kindergarten teacher, not, not the Indian government. I think this, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, I agree. It all starts with the teacher, absolutely. Except the infrastructure, when you look at rural and urban, when you look at poverty and low income, and when you look at schools, and whether or not they have 60 children in a broken down gym, or 25 students in a very well run classroom that has full internet access and computers for every student. And uh, I mean, it starts with a caring teacher, sure, but there is a huge inequity in where, in how our students are learning and what advantages we're giving them. And that is becoming larger and larger as the years go by. So I think there's sometimes only so much a caring teacher can offer the classroom. It is also mean, that, I mean, it is, it is tough, particularly if you're somebody who's holding down a job, sometimes you cannot even get into the classroom with a teacher, right? So online learning is going to be really important. I will say this urban rural set of differences, which I also think kind of get lost in these larger future of work conversations. Um, you know, I, I know that uh, there are manufacturers that we have heard from that are in small, you know, rural communities an hour to drive away from their local community college. The only way that they could keep their workforce up to grade with what's going on with, the, with their industry is that there's a school with a quality program that's willing to offer it online where they can set aside a room on the, off the shop floor and give folks paid time to sit there and take that course. If we did, you know, those are the kinds of things that when you're living in an urban area where it's a matter of whether it's an Uber ride away or a car ride away or a train ride away, it's a different set of challenges than it is when if you don't have a proximate school to take advantage of. And I think that's just one of the things that um, uh, this state obviously needs to reinforce with policymakers. Obviously, here at the state level, you all know that. I think in Washington, these things kind of get missed. I do think too that you know the challenge for rural communities is just in terms of as this technology wave is coming into different industries, the resiliency that we can expect from different communities is going to be different. I mean, rural communities don't have the diversity of industries, and if it's an industry that is significantly impacted and there's not another industry for folks to, to transfer over to, like that's huge. Um, I mean, you know, Walmart, the largest employer in this country, um, and there is probably a Walmart in almost every community uh, around the United States, um, they're also a company that knows that their technology is going to change their workforce. They know that they're, they're concerned about what's going to happen if when, they're, when their workforce is changing and their workforce needs are changing, like how it is that they're going to be able to keep workers ahead. Um, and they can train some of their own folks, but there's many of other communities that don't have the education system, have an aging, uh, an aging workforce that is probably not going to be doing as much retraining as a younger workforce. The composition of the workforce is different. There's a whole set of things, and it's not just like there's like urban and rural. There's like urban and six different kinds of rural. They did this whole, uh, this whole report on typing out different types of rural communities and what can happen if you're a community that has, you know, 
rich resources versus if you're a community that's sitting on a, a highway where you know transportation allows you to make product and you can get it to markets versus if you're geographically excluded and you don't have a post-secondary institution for 90 minute drive. I mean, all those communities are gonna respond very differently even though they're all rural to what's going on with this technological change. And I think that we need that nuance as we start to think about how we work with those communities in a more effective way to keep those companies and those workers uh, vibrant in this changing labor market. So I wanna go back a little bit to that online learning and we talked a little bit about it um, earlier that um, when we think back not that long ago with the predatory practices of some for-profit institutions when online learning first came uh, into play and it really took quite a while for the federal government to catch up and, and say that's bad or that's good. And so um, I, I just experienced this not that long ago. We had a gentleman, uh, foreign born, who was in our office and was thinking about taking a coding school online and thought, you know, the one that he was looking at, well, it looked good, so he was going to do it. And Tej is smiling because Tej knows um, that many times we come to him and we'll say, what do you think of this? And um, so when we talk about 70 million or more people that are going to need some type of upskilling and they're gonna to wanna to access it as quickly and as cost effectively as possible, how will we control what people think is good, what, what they're, they're buying into, how companies will monitor what, what is uh, acceptable and in alignment to their needs? I think for me it's, it's often credentials, uh, looking beyond what the, what the school or college is saying what they do. Um, I, I've had an employee come up who said, who, who had been a part of uh, predatory uh, pricing, where the college had, had her sign a loan application, where 50% of her income was pre-tax income, was to be paid to the college for a certain number of years. That was crazy. The moment I looked at the contract, I'm, not, I'm no lawyer, but I know how to read English. Uh, and reading that, I just, I just knew that it was, it may have been legal, but it was as unethical as, as a contract could be. Um, so I think, I think those of us who recognize those things, we have to call them out and we have to support those who are trying to fight it. Um, we're not gonna get rid of all the bad elements of society just by hoping for it. Uh, I think we have to call them out and, and then in the meantime, support those who, who need our help at that point to get out of those kinds of contracts. That's but the best I could do. Tej, in today's world, and again, as fast as it's moving, and we're telling people you've got to get this new education and new training, um, who will they turn to if they don't have a Tej in their workplace that they can go to? I think, I think that's, you know, again, I, I go back to, go back to my, my teachers from way back when, who taught me how to have the friend to, to receive help. Those friends became uh, colleagues, became, and now are mentors, even to this day. I mean, I'm, I'm 50 years old. I have four active mentors who will tell me the truth to my face and, and not worry about hurting my feelings. We have to teach from early days that, that we have to have a, a support system to lean on. Uh, and that support system can watch out when we are emotionally involved in something. When we think that the contract or the school or the, or the, the, the helper is helpful uh, and, and that conscience that's around us tells us, no, you're, you're a little too, too uh, starry-eyed at this time. Well, I think there are things too, you know, I mean, to follow the old adage, you know, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Someone's promising you that you're going to get everything you need to know in data analytics in 12 weeks. It's probably not going to happen and it's only going to cost you, you know, $12,000. Um, but there are things in place when you're, especially if you're looking at institutions, you know, regionally accredited institutions, you know, or not. 
you know, are going to be a good choice. And most of them do all types of training, whether it's credential or workforce development. Um, if a school is not able to get Title IV, which is your financial aid, you know, that would be, I think, a really big red flag. Um, oftentimes, and I don't think a lot of people know this, but you can talk to whatever office at any institution, even if that's not, so if you've got a program and you're not sure, you could reach out to other schools and at least, you know, talk to any of the advisors there to find out. So there are resources available, but as, I will tell you that one thing I'm sure is going to happen, that as these jobs come up and we don't have enough people to fill them, you will see for-profit entities starting to say, I'm going to, I can offer this training and you will be able to get this job. And I don't know that there's really, unfortunately, anything that can be done about that except hopefully to some extent be a, it's very easy for me to say from both like coming from a public institution and private institution at Drake, but when it's a for-profit education facility, not all of them are bad or the devil, but when it is a for-profit, you do have to be a little more buyer beware. Andy, your thoughts? Well, um, I think we should just be honest. There's a lot of Title IV funded programs that have put people in a lot of debt and have not and necessarily increased their earning power. So I do think we need to be clear that accreditation might be part of it, but the reality is is that we need to give people better information. You know, there was, a, there was an attempt by the Obama administration to create this college scorecard um, that really was only at the institutional level that was supposed to tell you a little bit about kind of like what the costs were relative to the income of folks when they, when they got out of school. They, even that's not very useful information. What you really need is you need program level information. I need to know if I enroll in this data analytics course or this welding course or this nursing course, I need to know like how many people complete it, how many people get a job from it, what are their wages you know, one, three, and five years after they completed that program. Um, and we can, and we have the ability to collect that information and publish it and hopefully make it usable for a good sh number of people who can make use of that information. We just have to decide to do it, and we should. We should not pay for, we should not pay for courses, we should not pay for programs if we're not going to show people what their chances are of succeeding if they go into that program. I think that should be a bottom line before anybody gets a public dollar. That said, even putting a lot of information out there. There are some folks who will be able to make critical, good, informed, critical decisions with that information, and some who are still going to be a little confused and not sure exactly what to do. And so I do think the role that industry and company can play to provide some guidance, what we can do with our workforce development system through our, our American Job Centers where they're supposed to be good and we need to have better, more robust career guidance for folks that they can kind of say, all right, I see all of this information, but I'm not exactly sure, kind of like which, is the, which are the programs, having a guidance counselor, not just in your high school, but as you're working across your career, who can help you make some informed decisions. Because I do think there's a lot of us, I probably would need that, some help in terms of interpreting what this, what this information is. Um, so limit the dollars to only go to credible programs that are willing to put their information out there. Try to get as much information out there in a usable way as possible, and then have somebody or have some people available to help people actually go through that information. There's still going to be some folks who are going to get, um, quite frankly, they're just going to get swindled. But I think we can reduce the number of those folks if we get more information out there and better guidance. Okay, I'm going to open it back up to all of you. Other questions, Pat. Pay is awful, up $13.80. And then you look at the demographics, we have nearly 10% of the workforce between the ages of 61 and 70. And you know, Andy, I guess I'll address this to you. Medicare and Medicaid are the big payer, and there's all some changes there. I don't know how we'll meet the needs of the state. Uh, everybody in here is probably going to need a direct care worker at some point in life. I'm married to a nurse practitioner, so I may be okay. But I'm worried about the rest of the Thoughts on that, Andy? How can we shift that? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the public reimbursement for community and home-based care and nursing home care uh, and the wages that are payable out of that is just wrong, right? We, I mean, that is something that we continue to need to talk about 
healthcare policy, not just, obviously the important perspective is how patients and clients are going to be served, but we need to recognize that they're not going to be served well without a better qualified, better paid workforce. Because after a while, like, folks will just not do those jobs, even as the demand is growing. And what happens then is, you know, it's, and it's, it's an interesting juxtaposition. We brought tech, we, when, when uh, we wanted manufacturing to get more productive, we introduced automation and technology. When we want front care worker, frontline caregivers to get more productive, we just ask them to work harder. Like we don't really, we just tell them to care for more people in the same amount of time, which is not good for the worker and it's not good for the, for the clients either. That's not a sustainable system. I am particularly concerned though in the context of this future work conversation because the reality is, is that we are gonna have just health systems in general are gonna be sending more people home to, you know, to, age, in, to age at home, to age in place, uh, to recover from uh, 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 procedures that before they used to recover in the hospital. And there's going to be new technology that is going to be brought in that can make that easier for people, but we do not have a workforce that is currently situated to make good use of that technology. If you have folks who are, um, who are not reading at a sufficient level to make use of the technology, when the technology goes down to understand how to troubleshoot it, um, that's, to me, in the future of work conversation, not only is that workforce not paid well, but we're not doing anything to train them. And now we think we're gonna have even more, them taking care of more folks with new technology and no plan for how it is we're gonna help them make effective use of it. So that's not a very good answer, other than you're absolutely right, Pat, that it's a, it's a tragedy in this country. We all are going to be impacted directly or, impact, or indirectly by that. I have parents who, you know, who have benefited from very good home care. Um, but I've also seen a lot of home care workers that have basically worked themselves into, um, uh, they've made themselves sick because the work is so hard and not well re reimbursed. Jay. How does immigration reform play in all of this? Without uh, adequate immigration, uh, there's, there's an even constricted flow of uh, workforce to answer Pat's question, to answer uh, my needs for a tech workforce, um, and and around the country over the last 20 years now, the nation's demographics are trending downward across all populations, um, and in the last 14 or so years, immigration has been on a steep decline. So the number of jobs we have in the market are increasing and the number of workers is decreasing. So the only thing I think of is what I read in a, a book by the Gallup CEO about, about a decade ago. I think, Jay, you and I read it together, The Coming Jobs War. And his, his prediction then was, we can either import the workforce we need or export the jobs we have. There wasn't much gray space in the middle. And I think Clifton was right a decade ago, he's right today. I mean, just think about it. If I had not been able to immigrate, well, become a citizen 22 some years ago, one of these chairs would be empty, <laughs> or with somebody else. Yeah. yeah, I have nothing to add to that. That's pretty much. Yeah, I would agree. I, I mean, I think that the one additional, um, and it's it's a sh because we have not really had an, uh, a discussion about comprehensive immigration reform in Washington for quite a while. Uh, it seems somewhat quaint to kind of talk about this, but years ago, as part of the immigration reform discussion, there was some consideration that if we were gonna make it easier for folks to immigrate, but we we're gonna have a certain set of expectations for them. So one of them was, in order to be able to legalize, you're gonna to have to achieve a certain education level, you're supposed to be able to demonstrate a certain stability in employment over you know, 10, 12 years. Um, not, a, not an insignificant set of hurdles um, with very few proposals about how it is that we could actually help folks who came here. Um, we have some folks who come here who are highly trained, highly educated, and are ready to do the job, and then we have other folks, um, it may just be a language issue, and other folks who actually do need some additional education and training. Um, and if we're not making provisions for that, even if we were to kind of create a, a more rational immigration reform system in this country, there's a whole set of immigrant integration uh, policies that we need to have in place in order to be able to do that. So this is an issue that we've been working on 
uh, with a range of business leaders and labor leaders and immigrant rights advocates to kind of talk about like what would what would the right system be that's actually going to help these folks train and uh, and bring value to their local communities in terms of as in their working lives. Um, we need to have some resources and plans behind that beyond just saying that this is what you need to do in order to be able to, to legalize at some point. I, I would I would add one piece having been to DC several times on, on the topic of attempting immigration reform, or even having a conversation that was coherent and logical uh, with either, either side of the aisle was impossible. Um, I, think, I think more than anything else, we need the political will to even acknowledge that there is a problem. Um, it was one of the most coherent proposals I, I've seen from anybody was from a very conservative senator, Jerry Moran from Kansas. Who, uh, who had it articulate, who had fairly comprehensive, not fully comprehensive the way President Obama envisioned it, but very comprehensive set of proposals in 22 pages. That was the bill. And he tried introducing in, it in two separate Congresses. Went nowhere. I could understand it. Again, not an attorney, I could understand everything from cover to cover in that bill. It was too plain, too simple, too straightforward. And there was no political will for him to get support on either side of the aisle. I think until there's political will, the uh, rest of the action is unfortunately just not even possible. Well, a prime example is sitting in our higher education institutions that are being educated here, are being integrated into our communities, and still can't stay. Andrea. Hi. Uh, this is maybe a little bit more general policy, more uh, maybe not necessarily fully workforce and a little bit more just general uh, uh, the um, automation that we're talking about. So we know government doesn't move very fast, uh, but we know that automation is only moving at a quicker and quicker pace. What can education, what can private business do to maybe help assist or guide government or should they? So that's my question. Well, I'm interested in the should they. <laughs> <laughs> well, government always needs guidance from people out in the real world, so that's not a question, right? Um, in terms of what the, I mean, I think that, I, I do think that part of the, um, and maybe bring this back to the, the presidential campaign a little bit, um, there are serious conversations going on about some of these issues, but you wouldn't know it because often what it is is that folks talk about these things in headlines and sound bites and things like that. Um, but unfortunately what happens is that after a while, that then does drive the conversation. So I think that having folks who are running companies, having folks that are running community colleges, who are running training programs, working people themselves, coming and talking to policymakers about this is actually the set of issues that we're dealing with on the ground on a day-to-day -day basis. And we actually think we have figured out some things that are going to make it easier for more people to get into these jobs. They're going to help more people succeed. And here are some ways that we can kind of stay ahead of this technology. Um, so you should really listen to us and kind of forget the ideological debates and really and demonstrate that you know, whatever, there's a variety of political perspectives that actually would support some of those things. So I think, I will, you know, all credit to people from Iowa because I do think that, um, at least as long as I've been at this, folks from this state have been very good at going to Washington to try to kind of bring that reality check to how it is that some of these policy conversations take place. Clearly you've done it here in your state capital because you have some leading programs that we point to when we kind of say like, there's a model of things that we should be doing in other parts of the country. So I do think that's, that's something where um, just bringing reality into the policy conversation would be incredibly helpful. And I, I, think, I think that's, I think you hit it. I think that happens and it happens a lot. It just doesn't make headlines and nobody sees it. I mean, President Martin is in DC um, a lot. President Martin is sitting in conference rooms with uh, area businesses, and if it's not President Martin, it's other representatives. Um, you know, we just, and you see it at that level, and we just met with Drake, my, and there's no other person but my colleague and I, who, uh, from Drake Online and Continuing Ed, just met with a room full of talent manage talent development managers that we do quarterly now just to have that conversation so that we are aware of what their needs are and we're going in the right direction. 
it doesn't work if these things aren't happening. And so even though it may seem like there's a lot of polarization right now, I think when it's boots on the ground, everybody's still coming together and doing what needs to be done. So. I think my colleague said it perfectly. I, I don't have anything to add. Any other questions from the audience? I'm going to let you each make a closing statement, um, but just one, one maybe last quick question. Um, earlier this summer, Blackstone Investments uh, donated more than $100 million to Oxford University in their humanities area around the ethical implementation of AI. Any thoughts around that whole subject well, matter? That is another new job that if you Google, the AI, what jobs are going to be created, there actually will be ethical engineers, ethical consultants um, to talk about um, because this brings up a whole host of new questions and new challenges um, in regards to ethical considerations so from everything from security to privacy to uh, the intent for how it's going to be used um, and the information. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that that I think, in, and Tej would know better than I, because he's got his finger on the pulse, but I think you're going to start seeing some significant court cases, probably, I'd say, probably in a decade. Oh, sooner than that. Uh, I think working, working in a company that's regularly, annually recognized for being one of the most ethical companies in the world, uh, this is uh, a constant conversation, whether we're talking about uh, our machine learning algorithms, our, our RPA, robotic process automation elements, our artificial intelligence investments, all happening just, you know, miles from here. But ethics of how we do that are a part of our, part of our conversation. It's not an after effect, it's, it's a part of the early process to say, is this the right thing to do? Is this what we should be doing? And does it, does it change our, um, our stance going forward. Uh, our, our position as one of the ethical com most ethical companies is important to us and we want to maintain that. And I think most data analytics, data AI programs, uh, institutions include uh, coursework in ethics. It just, it, it's not done without it. I'll leave it to these two things. Well, and it will come into play in policy, definitely. Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah. I mean, it's a hot topic, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Any other closing thoughts from our esteemed panels? I really know. I mean, thank you for having me here. I think it's a very important topic, and I think that if I could just say one thing, I think that the news media outlets you know, sometimes look for the story, and I think that they may um, provide half the story regarding AI, robotics, and what it can do. I mean, there obviously will be very impactful change, but it will be something that can be um, proactively good for the economy. It will create as many jobs as I, again, my personal opinion, I think it'll create as many jobs as it may um, change or disrupt but with the right planning and with the right conversations which are happening uh, this is something that will be managed as well not, not without its speed bumps but it will come out on the other side and we'll have a whole new industry so whether whether you're wearing one of the apple watches that's taking your ekg um, routinely or you're driving a car that slows down on cruise control when the car in front of you begins to slow down, not hit its brake, but slow down. Um, or you're a diabetic whose meter tells you, based on your blood sugar reading, whether you should uh, drink more water right now or get some movement. Automation is impacting your life in ways that it didn't a decade ago. So our lives, our individual's lives are changing remarkably today, and I think we're better for it. Um, so how we take those changes that we have received and then leverage them into the workforce that, that's coming behind us, whether it's kids, whether it's coworkers, or whether it's 
parents who are changing. Um, I think it's up to us to, to remain informed and re remain encouraging toward that changing future and, and embrace that change because through embracing, we continue to grow. Through rejecting, we're going to be left behind. Um, Mayor, I would just say first, thanks for doing this. Uh, thanks to the Iowa Caucus Consortium and to the Greater Des Moines Partnership uh, on behalf of National Skills Coalition. It is really such a pleasure to be able to come talk to and talk with folks who are dealing with these issues on, our, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, there's a lot of theorizing that goes on in the context of this future work conversation, but I do think that a lot of the solutions are rooted in things that people are figuring out day in and day out in companies in, in this state, in colleges and other learning environments in this state. Um, and I do think that that's the kind of expertise that needs to drive these conversations, whether it's talking to the political candidates as they're coming through your state, talking to your congressional delegation. I believe that we actually, there's no politics on this set of issues. Like there is clear agreement across party line. The only thing is that we need to create the general will and we need to show like what folks on the ground are already figuring out to drive what I think is gonna be some more rational conversations about how to keep businesses and workers ahead of this technological curve and to take the greatest advantage of it that we can. So thanks for the chance to come and have a conversation with you and looking forward to doing more of it into the future. Andy, thank you again to National Skills for your sponsorship. Tej, Christina, thank you so much for being with us today.